Perhaps I should just add this, that we had that reading concerning Samuel and um, uh, in sort of conversation over lunch or through the day, um, it just, you know, Peter expressed his, his thoughts, our dear brother, the pastor, of as we thought of Jesus going up to the temple and there was Samuel taken there, then unto the Lord as long as he lived. And then, of course, the prophet Samuel coming after being in that place of fulfilling a prophetic ministry. And that was the expression, the parallel, as it were, between Samuel in the temple, hearing the voice of God, learning how to hear the voice of God, at least hearing it, and then someone coming along thinking, no, he couldn't be. He couldn't have heard it. And then Samuel coming to that place, having to stand against the establishment of that day, if I can put it like this, so that when in later years, being empowered by the Holy Spirit, he could stand against anyone and everyone that came against him and his Lord. It was all part from the early days, a part of his preparing, a part of taking him on in that prophetic ministry. From what we read of John the Baptist, he didn't have that kind of um, preparation. But, 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 the preparation that he had was preparing him for the work that the Lord had separated him unto. And as we read these verses and sang them in the psalm tonight, uh, um, I, I, I just thought of verse 13, and th I was thinking of the second part of the verse, and thinking of John the Baptist. It says here in this word, thou, for thou possessed, and for thou possessed hast my reins, and thou hast covered me when I within my mother's womb enclosed, and enclosed was, was enclosed by thee, if I can put it like that to, um, you know, get it at least, not being used to singing in this um, mm, metrical expression as it is here. And we just think of him in his mother's womb, filled with the Holy Spirit from uh, <laughs> as he was conceived, under the control. I remember, was it maybe last time I came or something, you know, evidence of him being controlled by the Holy Spirit. When, when Mary entered, already pregnant, with the seed that was fertilized, or the eggs fertilized by the Holy Spirit, bearing the Lord Jesus Christ, Here was John in that place, sensitive, giving that kick, being moved in his way, expressing the joy in his heart. And then, of course, that springing off. The Blessed Mother carrying him, Elizabeth, bringing out that prophetic utterance. That is, that, that was how it just spoke to me, singing this psalm, this psalm tonight. And so we come. And one's very struck, at least I'm sure we all are, to think of what Jesus had to said, say about John, that he was the greatest 
of the prophets, however many prophets there had been, including Samuel, including Moses, including everyone who brought some ministry as moved by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, bringing prophetic utterance that was proven that they were of God and not of themselves, of, an human, of the human spirit. And John coming. And in whatever way that means, Jesus declaring him to be the greatest of the prophets. And um, one of the things that uh, uh, I see in this whole part of coming into this today and uh, preparing for the day of the, of the Lord, preparing, as it were, a word and then bringing the conviction, oh yes, this is the word for this evening. To see John ministering. John the Baptist ministering in power and in demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Not, as it were, with miraculous signs, but with a sign showing the effect of the power of his ministry, the effect of it, and especially sorting out of those who came out in a crowd of those who were taking in his ministry, believing it in their hearts, walking on in that way that was a way ahead. Not many steps to take before Jesus himself, the deliverer, the, 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 the Messiah, the promised one, the saviour would come. And those who just came out to see what was going on. That emphasis, what the ones coming out to see what was going on. We have evidence of that in the other gospel accounts. But beloved, it is with those thoughts. And then you see, I'm reminded looking at this now of verse 6 in this chapter, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Do you know, something's been burnt into my heart over these last, um, oh, not all that long ago. Perhaps I can say, once you have thoughts about it, once I would have had thoughts about it, this conviction coming. Luke's gospel is so different than the other accounts. There is a sense that you cannot link it up with Mark, or Matthew, or Mark, or John. A sense that you cannot link it up in this way. That it was not, it, Luke did not write his gospel message to for a wide broadcast. It was for one person only. In the first instance, of course, there is an application of it. That's why we, by the grace of God and his help by the Holy Spirit, oh, we all, for the whole of our Christian life, have had the benefit of this as of every part of the word of God. And, but in its first writing, both this and us closely linked together as volume one and volume two 
of a writing just to one person only and no one else. See that, and there's no such thing as you learn of in whatever theological college you've been to about the synoptic problem or other and synoptic, how they all fit in together. Of course they fit in together. But I believe being led up the garden path down that way misses the point. At least I say that. Perhaps because I feel so strongly about it. And the Holy Spirit just gives witness the extent that Luke was willing to go to to see that someone who'd been truly, I was going to say, indoctrinated. In one sense it is. Truly taught the teaching of the message of the gospel. Um, last time I was here, I'm conscious of this. I'm repeating the word again. He was catechized. Whoever was witnessing to him, it was coming along, someone else, seeing that he was instructed in, in, in the words in everything. And you can see what the Holy Spirit was dealing with him. He was most excellent Theophilus. I suppose in the place that he might have been, he was exactly the same as Pilate here. Pilate, Pontius Pilate, was one of four. He had part of this four-part division, the Tetrach, as well as being over them. As well as being over them. Um, oh, I don't know whether I should just go and take it. The way things are going of the Anglican Church in Wales, they've got five bishops, right? I'm just illustrating now. They've got five bishops, and the archbishop, you see, is a bishop of a diocese. When Rowan Williams, before he came out, became Archbishop of Canterbury, he was the Bishop of Monmouth. And as the Bishop of Monmouth, he was also elected or chosen, the way they do it, whatever way, Archbishop. Two jobs of work. I tell you how they get over it when he's out, right? And he goes to meetings. And sometimes in the day, um, let me take Barry Morgan, who used to be in Llandaff. When Barry Morgan was in Llandaff, when he'd be out for the day in a conference or whatever was going on, when he was acting as the bishop of Llandaff and speaking as a bishop of the diocese in this gathering of the day, he was dressed in his sort of, is it puce, purple, not purple, you know what I mean, that particular color, right? When he was then going to speak in the afternoon, all right, he'd go to some changing room, and then instead of coming out in that color, he'd come out in green with a white crown collar. So the people knew that when he stood there, he wasn't standing there as the Bishop of Llandaff, he was standing there as the Archbishop of Wales. And it's like, if I can just put it like this, I'm only using this by illustration. When Pontius Pilate was acting in one of these four divisions, he was a tetrarch in that sense, on equal par with all the rest. When he then was over the other three in that sense, well, of course, he was, if I can put it like that, he was the Arch Tetrach amongst them, Pontius Pilate. I didn't mean to go down this particular road, but look, when indeed there was all this shunting about, I would use that word, of the Lord Jesus. They wanted to get to a particular 
uh, uh, verdict or uh, about to, to, to get to put Jesus on the cross. Jesus was shunted around. And then he was brought back. And Pilate was really fed up to his back teeth. Terrible, I should use language like this, isn't it? He was fed up to the back teeth of coming and this being what it is. And then there was a sign put up. Do you know there are three signs? What the accusation of concerning Jesus in Mark is merely the charge seat, right? And then there were three signs. Each sign is authentic. The order of the writing of the languages are different. There were three signs. Every one is authentic. Every one is a true historical record of what went, went, went on in, the, in those places. And when it comes back, those signs are no good. The sign was good when it came up in, before uh, in one place. The sign was good when it came up the second place. Then it comes to, to, to Pontius Pilate. And you remember, there had been three signs. There had been two signs with sets of writing in it, different orders. There's no discrepancy. That's exactly what went on as a result of what was done in that particular place. And then it comes to him. This is the king of the Jews. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Then they, they wanted to alter it. Don't write that. The accuser said, write that he said that he was the king of the Jews. And Pilate comes along. He wouldn't have that under all costs. So what did he say? What I have written stands written. You can paraphrase it and you've got to put it like this because when you read the tenses of what he, spoke, what he said to them. What I have written stands unalterably written. And that was the sign, as it were, if I could use the word prevail, that was the sign that was put up last of all. And that's an answer to those who say that they find discrepancies. No discrepancy. Every single one recorded of the three other, the other two, every number one and number two in the order that they went around, is right, absolutely right. And this is right, absolutely right, in that it's the third and final sign to be put up. And so far as Pilate is concerned, no one is going to alter that. And you know what that does? It establishes it. So much so. It stands written like that today. Recorded in the Holy Scriptures. So sure, so sound, so solid is this blessed testimony. Now I've got to get back to verse 6. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Just imagine Theophilus reading that. Knowing that he comes in as a single person of the all flesh. A single person outside of Israel, 
outside of the Jews, a Gentile, a single person, as someone who sees the salvation of God. If I were hopping back now to Simeon, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and to be the glory of thy people Israel. Do you know why I'm smiling? Because as I'm trying to make a point here, by the Holy Spirit, Simeon brings it a light to lighten the Gentiles. He puts that first. And to be the glory of thy people Israel. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder how much a leap would have been in the heart of Theophilus when he would have looked at this and looked at that and no ooh it's underlining the Holy Spirit as it were is putting a seal and a stamp upon all that has been taught and particularly 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 and beloved that's the purpose of this gospel document and all of acts, may I say, the primary purpose. And blessed be God for what we all receive out of the secondary purpose. Oh, beloved, it shows the length that the Lord goes to to speak to us, for he speaks to us as he spoke to Theophilus. Does he not? Yes. 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 He speaks to us because one as one by one God is so meticulous that the message might come to us, that we might come to him, that we might be drawn, that we might be able to enjoy the blessing of salvation with the same joy and enjoyment that is in his heart as the Father in the Son. And these things are bound to be shared by the Holy Spirit. Because all three, in perfect unity and harmony, share together all these things and what they share together. We have a share in it. In that blessed statement, all familiar to us, the grace, the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit coming and taking and bringing and moving so that we might enjoy the blessing of salvation so that the purpose of the enjoyment might be worked out. Not for the selfish in grandisement of ourselves, but for those who have yet to hear and receive and rejoice in so great a Saviour, so great a salvation, and respond to so great a message. 
well, now then I'm well off screen here. But uh, that doesn't really matter. Should anyone be looking in? I'm sure you've been blessed in here as much off screen as what you might hear when you see my lips move. Now then, let us look at the power of John's, the Baptist's ministry. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Some would have come because they would have wished. That's why they came, to flee from the wrath to come. Some would have only come to see what was going on. There were many who came to see, you read about in other accounts, they came to see what was going on. Not because they wanted to be a participant in it, but not because of general inquisitiveness, but because what was going on was completely upsetting the thing that they were into. And they didn't wish to be upset. And they couldn't ignore the fact that something was going on that caused them to be so upset. And so you can see the way that the ministry of John the Baptist was having this effect. It was having its effect because of the the Oh, the substance, I don't know whether I should use the essence, because of the very vitality, the very vitality of the propheticness that was in the ministry. The effective propheticness, if I could coin that phrase, I don't have doubt about it before, of his ministry as a prophet raised up for such an hour than day that was his. And he said, Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance and begin not to so look like he's got insight into the hearts where they come and begin not to say that you have Abraham. As, as our Father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones, they were lying around there, around there, God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. He's saying a profound thing. Let's think of Adam formed of the dust of the earth, formed of clay, shaped and fashioned, and then being breathed into. And Adam becoming a living soul, and then all the evidence of life being manifest, able to get up on his feet as the Anthropos, as the one looking up, walking up, up upright, Adam before the fall. And here's these stones, as hard as stones. Do you know, do you know, the stoniness of their hearts was harder. Adam was the art harder than the stone that was there. And God was able to, God was able to change if he so wished. 
able to change that to live. Children of Abraham. True children of Abraham. Real children of Abraham. Oh, beloved. Beloved, beloved, beloved. Think of the grace of God working in the stoliness of heart, causing us with that new life within to be able to joy and rejoice in him. And, oh, oh, beloved, in the words of 2 Corinthians 3, write his word on the fleshy table of the heart. And then upon the chapter that we have this treasure in hearth and vessels that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of us. Oh, the glory, glory, glory of the workings of grace and glory be to God. Oh, it causes me, you see, fair to laugh. The power of the mystery of John the Baptist. Why is it like this? So that souls might be saved. And then he comes on. Now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree therefore that bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people cry out, What shall we do then? They knew there was only one thing for them as they were And as they would be unchanged, only one end. What shall we do then? And then he goes on to show them what is this fruit of repentance. And he says, I'm a, a, perhaps I ought to get in by end with just one other thing, one other thing. It's all bound up with this. You see, his was a baptism unto repentance. It didn't depend, as it were, just on what was going to happen then. The thing that there was dependent and the thing he was looking to was what was going to happen. And we can say very soon, because we know that Jesus is coming on the scene. There's going to be three years of ministry. And when this work is so effective, then they are going to rejoice in the blessing of the forgiveness of the remission of their sin through the precious blood of Jesus, it's going then to come to its perfect work. That's a baptism unto repentance. Because that's the end. That's the place he wants to get all these people to. So steadfastly is he in his heart concerning the ministry committed unto him. Oh, there's something of fire in his bones. Or in his spirit through and through. He is burning with a zeal. And blessed be God, somehow by the Holy Spirit, he comes and puts a burning zeal in our hearts. We long to see people coming into and coming through and getting out the other end of coming 
to know the Lord Jesus and believing upon him. Oh, this is the purpose of this place being here as it was. I don't know how much past 25 years of, 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 of ago when it was first started in that place which I understand was called St. John's Hamblance Hall, hence the name of this place, St. John's. There, because there were people with fire in their bones and in their spirits, determined to bring things through in this way. To the end, we, that we are trying to grasp. Hallelujah, praise God. We are unable to grasp it. It's so real. It's so gripping. Oh. I do personally thank the Lord tonight. It's as real as what I can remember. A way back in April 1957, and you have your starting date. And before the starting date, oh, I can go back in my memory to people who would have taught me when I was but three years of age. Looking back, seeing what they were, seeing how faithful they were. Others, faithful on the line. <coughs> oh, I can remember. There was a dear man, after I was evacuated, um, I went to an English congregational Sunday school when I was evacuated. When I came back, my best pal in school happened to be long to a congregational church. I went along, and there was a man, David Roberts, Di Roberts. Oh. Can you imagine him and the boys of 11, 12 in Sunday school, keeping them on John 15 for 12 months or so? 12. Pitch it back, 10, 11. I see him soon afterwards, riddled with Parkinson's disease. He is, I'm on the pavement outside of a castle gardens, place made up now because the place was built in the war. Low box, privet hedge, box hedge, no higher than that. Him on one side in the park. I'm on the path. David Roberts, I said. I've been saved by grace. Oh, my dear boy, my dear boy, my dear boy. I can imagine him trying to jump over the box hedge just to be with me on the pavement. After all those years, being faithful, being faithful, not because it's me, but seeing the fruit of seeds sown faithfully. Who'd have thought? Perhaps, yes, likely, something out of that 12 months and more. Oh, a dear man like that. I won't get on that now because I'll be getting too nostalgic. And that won't do at all. And then you see, out of the people at the ask, they were those 
who said, what shall we do? If you got two cards, impart to him who does not have a coat. If you have foods, plural, plenty to eat, give to him that has nothing to eat. Getting them to go on, as I've tried to say, looking and stepping and living onward so that they might live then in the future in for them the very short near future and then the publicans the tax gatherers what does he say? Exact no more than that which is appointed for you to tell. Don't take more tax out. Don't put on their bill more than the official bill. And pocket the rest. Charge them the exact. Exact is the word translated in the King James Version. Charge them the exact amount. And then we read and the soldiers likewise demanded of him. They, they were a bit more forceful because, you see, all above them demanded of them. And the attitude of mind of being so demanded of means that they demand of John an answer. And what did he say? Do no violence to no man. Neither accuse anybody falsely. Be content with your wages. That is, wages, you've got to say. Be content with the allowance that you have. Be content with what is doled out to you. Be content with that. Don't take them for a ride. Which means that at the end of the ride, they're out of pocket. No. Soldiers. Soldiers coming out. Why were soldiers coming out? To him. They were drawn. God had a purpose of drawing him out. What did Jesus say? No one comes unto me except the Father who has sent me. Draw him. And what is happening through the ministry of the forerunner? The Father is drawing souls to Jesus. Jesus is yet to come on the scene. But they're being drawn so that when he does come on the scene, they might travel on. And come past Calvary and on. The first missionary endeavors to Britannia was not a gospel venture of preaching the gospel, it was a pastoral ministry to Roman soldiers. This is not the place to go into the story of that. But it's a fact. When the Roman army was in this country, because there were people during the days, the <laughs> early days of the Acts of the Apostles, who came to the Lord Jesus, soldiers. And they were posted here, there, and everywhere within the bounds of the Roman Empire. So great was the grace of God that saved them and kept them and was keeping them that he 
salt. In the economy of his plan to send people this way with a pastoral ministry. The plans were upset for a while and it became turned into a gospel endeavor, but as soon as possible, get back on track of its ministry at the same time and spread to all the provinces in Britannia. Two, definitely, perhaps three, were north of what we would now say north of the border. All that had to be given up because they could not stand against. The might of Rome could not stand against the people who lived in the highlands and islands of Scotland. But thank God the saving work of his grace came to the land in which we stand so that they might be a Christian witness unto those who were here before us that we might be here together to carry on with such a Oh, I can't think of words to put together to try and describe the glorious task of taking this message of so great a salvation because of so great a saviour. And like this morning, perhaps that's the best place to start. I'm quite to finish, because anything else will just cut the ground from under it. And thanks be to God, I trust. Oh, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, for your blessing again far beyond what we might have ever wanted in our hearts. Bless this dear company of people. Bless especially the servant whom you have chosen to be here and caused to remain at this particular time. Thank you for all that speaks of the blessing of your grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.